morning. Great to see everyone here this morning. If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And if you will, keep this place marked in your Bible because this is going to be the foundation of our lesson today. We're going to be referring back to several verses as we go. If you're visiting with us, we're in a series entitled Lost. And what we've been doing in this series is we've been talking about some biblical principles that we have lost or forgotten, not only within our culture, but also in many cases within the church. We've talked about integrity, we've talked about honor, we've talked about loyalty. Last week, Darius Hall, and he did a fabulous job, I actually got to go back and and watch his sermon last Sunday morning, but he kind of followed along with the theme by dealing with submission. And today, well, I'm just going to go ahead and, and tell you this morning, this is going to be an extremely difficult lesson because there are going to be times when it's going to be very uncomfortable. And I apologize for that. I, I don't like anyone to, to be uncomfortable, but... Um, there are probably going to be some, some times here in this sermon it's, it's going to be uncomfortable, but I feel like it's something that needs to be preached because it is a biblical principle, and I certainly see us falling away from it, drifting away from it, not only within our culture, but also within the church today. But I want you to know, as I'm, I'm preaching this, and, and I hope and, and pray that it comes across this way, that I am preaching this out of love. Um, I love you, God loves you, and I, I feel like it's my responsibility as a minister to, to share with you principles from, from God's Word, even though at times they contradict the way our culture thinks and believes, and, and you know, even though it may be uncomfortable, I, I still feel like it's my responsibility to stand before you and, and teach these things because I want you to be in a right relationship with God as well. The topic that we're going to be dealing with today is purity. You know, I have a, a home page that I keep my, well, my internet on. It's the Christian Post. And essentially what it is is numerous articles um, from, you know, all types of uh, religious events, all types of things going on in, in the religious world. And, and there was a guy who wrote on purity. And in this article that I read this week, he puts, USA Today recently published the results of a national survey among 18 to 31-year-olds regarding cohabitation, and that's individuals who are living together. He says a whopping 76% of young Americans said that living together before marriage is fine. And what really concerned me is he went on to say that 65%, many of which who identify themselves as Christians, now live together before marriage. And he goes on that actually... Billy Graham wrote on this, this very topic, and there was an individual who, who commented uh, after he wrote this article, and this is what the individual wrote. He says, my girlfriend and I are living together. He refers himself as JK. He says, but her parents have let it be known they don't approve because God doesn't like it. He said, I don't understand. He says, what's the big deal? is so common today that I don't see why anyone should object. And, and I think he, he nails it on the, the head when he says this is, this is something that has become very, very common. Purity is, is something that within our culture, within the church, today we're, we're losing. We're, we're acting like it's, it's not a big deal. And so what I want us to do is I want us to look at God's Word, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and I want us to know what, notice what Paul wrote to the church 
at Thessalonica through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. This is, this is God-inspired. Notice what he says in the first eight verses. He says, Finally, brothers, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you're living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. For you know what instructions, or if you really start to look at this in the Greek, you could put the word command there. For you know what instructions or command we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. It is God's will that you should be sanctified. That you should avoid sexual immorality. That each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the heathen, who do not know God, and that in this matter no one should wrong his brother or take advantage of him. The Lord will punish men for all such sins, as we have already told you and warned you. For God did not call us to be what? Impure. But to live a what? A holy life. Therefore, he who rejects this instruction or command does not reject man... In other words, this has nothing to do with me and my instruction, in my, my command, but rather it's God, and notice what he says, who gives you his Holy Spirit. Now the first thing that I want us to notice in this writing is that Paul uses this phrase, you should live to please God. Now so oftentimes I, I find myself doing just the opposite of that. I, I, I live at times for, for me. I'm, I'm a very selfish person at times. But Paul is saying, look, as a Christian, as a member of the Lord's church, you are to live to please who? You're to live to, to please God. Now, now, what does that look like exactly? I mean, how... how how do we please God? What is, what is a life that is pleasing to God look like? Well, here's one thing. It's, it's going to be a life that is holy. Some of your translations may say sanctified. And you say, well, well Slate, what exactly do those two words mean? I mean, what does it mean to, to live... Uh, a holy life. Well, it means to live a life that is set apart for God. My, my life is, is to, to please God because as we saw this morning by partaking of these emblems, you know, God sent His Son to die for us. He purchased us with His blood. We belong exclusively and I think that's the key word here, exclusively to God and no one else. You look at 2 Peter, or 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, and this is, this is how Peter words it, but you are a chosen people. Do you realize that? As, as a Christian, you're, you're chosen. God, God has chosen all of us that, that we would be saved. Now, a lot of people reject that. They, they don't choose God, but God has chosen for, for you and I to be saved, to be His people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and then watch this, a people belonging to who? To God. That you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into wonderful light. Now, now the King James Version puts it like this, you and I as Christians, we are to be a peculiar people. Peculiar. In other words, we are, we are called to be different from the rest of the world. But, but let me say this, we're not just different because of our name. Because of the, the name or title, Christian, or, or disciple of Christ. We talked about this in our men's class Wednesday, Wednesday night. What makes us different as God's people is how we live. 
Because there are a lot of people who wear the name Christian, who wear the name disciple, or I'm a follower of Christ, but they're not living for Christ. And we're called to live, we're called to please God Almighty. You know, there are two rivers that run through Europe. One is the Rhone River, and as you can see, man, it is just absolutely beautiful. It's, it's crystal clear. But also there's another river that runs right beside it. It's called the Ar River, and it's very dirty. It's, it's, very, it's very muddy because that water flows down and it picks up all the slush from the mountains and the muck and all that kind of stuff, and it washes into that river. And what's interesting is these two rivers, they run side by side for several miles. In fact... Um, you know, it, it'll go on till it gets about two miles outside of, of Geneva, and, and, and they will stay divided, two different rivers, but then they begin to come together into one channel. And even after they come together, for several miles, as you can see, this is where they come together, the, the waters, they, they stay divided. You've, you've got pure, clean water over here, and on the other side, you've got this murky, muddy water. And for a stretch of several miles, in this one channel, you will have this division until the channel goes under the mountain, and when it comes out on the other side, it's called the Rhone River, but it's muddy, and it's murky, and it's dirty, just like the Arv River. And the point is this, you know, Satan is not worried about what you call yourself. You can call yourself a Christian, you can call yourself a disciple of Christ, I'm a, I'm a follower of Christ, Satan could care less. If you title or label yourself in that way, as long as you live a life that is sinful and dirty and impure. But God wants us to be holy. Set apart for His purposes. Distinctive. Different. Sanctified. I know several years ago, Julie and I, we were on our way to my mom and dad's house, and we, we would always go over there for the Alabama games. We'd be decked out in all our Alabama gear, and we'd have the flags flying on the side of the car, you know. And, and uh, as we were going to mom and dad's, we passed a yard sale. And Julie said, you know, I'd really like to go to that yard sale. We've got a little bit of time left. Could, could you turn around? Let's, let's go back. We, we love yard sales. So anyway, I turned around, and, and, and we get out of the car, and the guy who is, you know, putting on the yard sale, as soon as we get out of the car, he says, oh, man, he says, I've got just the thing for you folks. He said, I know why you're here. I know what you want to buy. And he went over to a box and he said, here it is. He pulled out an Auburn shirt. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, sir, we're not here to buy your garbage. You know, we want... we're looking for hidden treasures. But anyway, we had a good laugh and, and we got back in the car and, and Julie said, did you notice that? She said, immediately, without us saying anything, as soon as we got out of the car, he knew that we were Alabama fans. Because of the, the clothes that we were wearing, because of the flags that were flying. And she said, you know, I wish, I, I just wish there was some way that I could wear something, you know, so that when people will see me out in the community, they go, man, she's a Christian. And so Julie went out and she bought a cross and she's wearing it. She's been wearing it for, for several years and there's nothing wrong with that. But let me, let me say this. You can carry around a Bible. You can buy the Christian t-shirts. You can buy the bumper stickers that say churches of Christ salute you and have the, the Jesus fish on the, the back of your, your car. You can wear a cross necklace. But let me tell you something. The world will really never know who you are as a Christian until they see you living it. God calls us to, to live it, to be holy, to be, to be set apart. And one of, the, one of the ways that we are to be holy and, and to be 
set apart is to be sexually pure. And this is where it's going to get a little uncomfortable. Like I told you, I want to share this lesson with you in love because I think this is something that is, that is really fading in our culture, even, even among Christians. And let me tell you this, this was, this was not easy for the church at Thessalonica to hear. Because you see, they lived in a very immoral culture. In fact, for the, the Thessalonian businessman, it was not uncommon for him, of course, to have a wife who would bear him children, and her responsibility was to take care of that wife and, and to take care of the home. But it was also not uncommon for the Thessalonian man to also have a mistress on the side who his wife knew about, who he provided for. It was also not uncommon for him to have a slave who he would treat as a concubine. It was also not uncommon for him to occasionally to go and find a harlot or a prostitute. And, and here's the thing, in that culture, no one looked at that as being shameful. No one looked down upon anyone for, for doing those, those types of things. And so here's Paul. Man, he is writing something that is so countercultural. He comes along and he says to the, to the church there, at Thessalonica, he says, guys, he says, you can't do that. He says, you've got to remain pure. And I, I know you're surrounded by it. I, I, I know that um, this is something that's very prevalent in your culture. But he says, as a Christian, you, you can't do that. And, and that's the thing. Saying yes to Christ sometimes means saying no to some of the things that our world endorses that our world says yes to. Now don't misunderstand me this morning. Paul is not saying stay clear of sex. The, the command is stay clear of sexual immorality. Adultery. Fornication. Homosexuality. In fact, you look at verse 3, this time from a different translation, and, and notice what Paul says. God wants you to be what, church? holy. And so what does that mean? Stay away from sexual sins. But that's not what we're being fed today, right? From our culture, that, that's not what our, our children are, are being fed. What, what our culture says is, hey, when it comes to sex outside of marriage, listen, just be safe. Just, just protect yourself from disease, from, from pregnancy, from, from all those things. That's what really matters is, is look, just, just, just be safe. And God says, no. You don't do anything like that at all. In verse 7, he goes on to say, God has not called us to be dirty-minded or full of lust, but to be clean. To be holy. But just as the young man, as I was reading his comment in the very beginning, but, you know, you look around, it's so prevalent. I mean, it's, it's all around us. Everyone else is, is you know, a, a part of that. But here's the thing. This is what we've got to understand and realize as Christians, we're not everybody else. We're set apart for God. We belong to Him. We're to be holy. We're, we're to be... We're to be sanctified. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 13. Paul writes, The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. I want to go a little bit more in depth this morning because some of you may be, under, may be asking the same question that young man was asking. I just don't understand. I mean, what's the big deal? I mean, really, what, what is the big deal? Why is sexual immorality not for the Christian? Let me share with you a couple of reasons why from the text. First of all, it shows that we don't really know God. You know, you go back to um, the, the text here, and Paul talks about how if we live in passionate lust, we're, we're like the heathen who what? Who doesn't know God. You know, when, when we disregard God's Word, 
When we set His Word aside and we pretend, we act like, we rationalize the the sins that we're committing by saying, God's okay with this, God loves me, this is okay, we really don't know the God that we serve. Because as you can see in just a few of the passages I've already mentioned, God doesn't approve of this. He doesn't approve of that lifestyle. Some of you may say, well, Slate, man, you're, I think you're being a little, a little strict here. Let's look at another passage. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 3 through 6. Paul this time is writing to the church at Ephesus, and he says, but among you, there must not even be a what? A hint. Not even a, a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or greed, because these are what? They're improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking. In other words, I don't don't want you telling dirty dirty jokes. I don't want you, you know, throwing out these dirty innuendos. You know, I don't want you doing any type of that stuff. You know, I I, I don't want there to be a hint of sexual immorality among you. He says, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving... For this, you can be sure of, and this is why I'm I'm sharing this lesson with you this morning, because I love you. He says, No immoral, no impure, or greedy person, such a man is an idolater, has an inheritance in the kingdom of God and of Christ. No immoral, impure, greedy person has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. That's why I'm saying, I, I know this is uncomfortable this morning. I don't like, I don't like talking about it. But, but if there's something that could keep you from being with God, I feel like I need to, to share that with you. And to share that with our future generations. And he goes on to say, Let no one deceive you with what? Empty words. For because of such things, God's wrath comes down upon those who are disobedient. Wrath. God's wrath is, is a very real thing when we're, when we're disobeying Him, when we're living outside of, of His will for us. He says it's very real. And so He says, don't let people deceive you with these empty words. Hey, listen, it's just pictures. I mean, the human body, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. It's okay for you to look at that. That's why God gave it. To, to men and, and women to, to be looked at. and Or you know what? Hey, listen, don't feel bad about that. Everyone does it. Oh, this is, this is something that's prevalent. It's, it's okay. You know, one of the things I was thinking about is, is I would never have bought into that when I was a kid. Because my mom and dad would always tell me, and y'all have heard this a thousand times too, you probably use it on your own kids, those of you who, who have kids, and that is, if everybody else is jumping off of a mountain to their death, would you do it? And I mean, logically, we sit there and we go, no, 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 but yet, many times we, we use that, that same philosophy to rationalize in our head. Well, everybody else is doing it, but we know that just because everybody else is doing it doesn't make it right. God is very serious when it comes to sexual immorality. And really, when we live outside of that, we, we prove we don't really know God. But then also, sexual immorality is not for the Christian because it disregards others. Notice you, you go back, and Paul says in our text, 1 Thessalonians 4, in this matter, no one should wrong his brother or take advantage of him. Now, what is Paul doing? Well, he's, he's confronting the myth that if, if you live a sexual immoral, immoral life, you're not hurting anybody. But really, that's wrong. All sexual looseness is an injustice against another person. In fact, you know how Paul regards these types of people in the text? Look back. He calls them a thief. 
And you say, no, wait a second. Why in this world would, would Paul call, the, call them a thief? What are they stealing? Well, they're stealing someone else's relationship with God. Because they're living in sin. They're stealing someone else's spouse. Their relationship with their spouse. And it just, man, it, it goes on and, and on and on how, how this thing is twisted. We could even pull it into the church. They're, they're, stealing, they're stealing victory from, from the Lord's church. And you say, oh, come on, surely, surely God wouldn't, wouldn't take away the victory of an entire church because of one person. Have you ever read the book of, of Joshua? Next quarter, I'm going to be a, doing a study on Sunday morning in the auditorium on the book of Joshua. And right now, I'm, I'm reading the book of Joshua, and I, I've just finished up studying the story of Achan and how he rebelled against God. And because of one man, victory was taken away from an entire nation. And when we're out here living an impure life, man, you think about the victories that we cost the Lord and His church. I, I think one day on the Day of Judgment, we're going to get up there and we're going to realize there were a lot of victories that were just taken away because we weren't living for God. And so, definitely, we're, we're disregarding others. And you say, well, Slate, you know, I think you're, you're really being a little too hard on this. And, and maybe I am, but, you know... I think one of the reasons I'm, I'm so passionate about this subject is because I'm one of the people that sits across from couples who are breaking down and they're crying because their relationship has been destroyed because of adultery. And their kids, their family has been absolutely been torn apart because of adultery. And I'm usually one of the ones that's sitting across from two parents who are crying about their teenage daughter who hasn't even finished school, and she's gotten pregnant out of wedlock. And I'm usually the guy that's talking to someone at the hospital because they're, they're dying of some sort of sexual disease. And so I see that as, as a minister, the harm and the damage that, that this causes. Listen, it's not private. It's, it's not a matter of, of I'm not hurting anybody. Because again, all sexual looseness is an injustice against another person. Hebrews chapter 3, verse four, 13, verse 14 says, Marriage should be honored by everyone. And a husband and wife should keep their marriage pure. God will judge as guilty those who take part in sexual sins. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 10 says, Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Well, who do you consider to be, be wicked? He says, Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexuals, offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanders, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And it says that throughout the New Testament. Let me share with you one reason why God feels so strongly about this sin. He points it out in His Word. Sexual sin is unique from all other sins. You say, Slate, what are you talking about? I mean, we've always been told that a sin is a, a sin. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 18-21, through 21, this is what God says. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins, a man what? commits are outside his body. But watch the difference here. But he who sins sexually sins against his own body. And it gets even more serious. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. There's a difference. Which leads us in our last point this morning. A sexual moral life is a life that rejects the Holy Spirit of God. Verse 8 says, He who rejects his instruction does not reject man, but God who gives you his Holy Spirit. You know, I think so many times when we're talking about, to people about being pure, 
I think many times we, we come at it from the, the wrong direction, especially as we're talking, talking to Christians. We'll say, you know, you really don't need to be doing that as a Christian because you could get some sort of disease. Or, you know, you really don't need to be doing that as a Christian because you could get pregnant. Or, you, don't, you know, you really don't need to be doing that because you could hurt your reputation. Well, all of those things are, are very real consequences but you know what? The, the Bible doesn't deal with any of those things. What the New Testament says is be pure. Don't engage in those things because your body houses the Spirit of God. That's serious. It goes on to say in verse 5, don't be a slave of your desires. Your desires do not have to control you. You learn to control your body by listening to the Spirit. We're out of time. I, I want to close out with, with this. I, I know that from time to time, our family, we have company. And, and when company is coming, man, let me tell you, our family goes into clean mode. Uh, my wife, I mean, she starts... You know, getting the kids to clean their rooms and everybody gets assignments. You know, you're cleaning the toilets and you're cleaning the, the floor. And I mean, she wants it spotless because we have visitors that are going to be coming to our home. Well, let me tell you something. There is someone who is coming that is a lot more important than any visitor that you could have in your home. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to come back one day. And the question is, are you pure? Are you clean? Are you living holy? Are you living to, to please Him with your body, with your life? If, if you haven't been, don't, don't misunderstand me this morning and say, man, that's it. It's over. I'm, I'm lost. No, listen to me. There's still hope in Jesus Christ. If you're not a Christian, you can come to Jesus this morning. You can be washed in His blood through the watery grave of baptism, having all your sins completely washed away, beginning anew. Or if you are a Christian, and, and maybe there's some sin that you've been living in, you know what? 1 John chapter 1 says that if you are faithful to confess your sins before God, He's faithful to forgive you. You can be forgiven of those things. Now I realize that this is an uncomfortable subject this morning. And I realize that there may be some of you here this morning who are thinking to yourself, you know what, there is no way that I could come forward in a lesson like this and, and confess or, you know, say anything because people are going to start thinking bad things about me. Listen, you don't have to come up here and sit on this pew. Our elders, they will be um, throughout the, the, the foyer. You can pull one of them. You can confess to them. You can come. I've, I've had individuals come up to me, come into my office and say, I couldn't come up front and, and say this in public, but I'm addicted to pornography. And, and I just need your help. I, it's destroying my family. It's destroying my life. And I just need to confess that. I need prayers. I need your help. I need some accountability. And, and we can do those things. But this morning, if you need to come forward and, and confess something publicly, You'd like the prayers of the entire church. We'd love to do that for you. But if you need to respond, won't you come? Together we stand and sing.